In John chapter 13, we read these words in verse 33. John 13, 33 says, Little children, I am with you a little while longer. You shall see me, and, I, and as I said to the Jews, I now say to you also, where I am going, you cannot come. Jesus now prophesies that he is going to leave them, that due to the, the rejection, he now must take his leave of them. This leads to chapter 14, verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am you may be also. Here we have a reference, the very first reference, the very first clear reference to the rapture or Jesus saying, I'm going, but I'm coming back to receive you unto myself to take you to be with me. Now, this is really done in weddings today and most certainly was done in oriental weddings where the bridegroom would go and prepare the place of abode for the bride. Then when it was time for the marriage, he would come get the bride and take the bride to be with the bridegroom at the place that the bridegroom had prepared. It would be just like today where the husband-to-be goes out and finds the place to live and then comes for the bride in order to take her to their new abode. Well, what Jesus Christ does is he uses this imagery to describe the rapture. He says, because of the expectation of the rapture, you do not have to be troubled. That even though there are, there are troubling times, troubling situations, and trifling people, the rapture, the expectation of the return of Jesus Christ should calm you. Now that raises the question, of course, well, how am I going to be calm if you're not here? And that's why in the same chapter, Jesus says in verse 16, and I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever, that is, the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not know him or, or know him or behold him. But you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. Jesus says, I'm going to leave, but I'm going to still be with you in the person of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will take up the slack until such time as I come to be with you personally. So they faced the same thing we face today, and that was a physically absent Messiah. There was no Jesus Christ going to be physically long-term with them. He was going to leave them the Holy Spirit, and he was going to leave them a promise, and the promise was that he was going to come get them, and that getting them is, in fact, the rapture. There's another reason why the rapture is an important part of the life of the church, and that's John chapter 17. John chapter 17, verse 24 says, Father, I desire that they also, referring to believers, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, in order that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou didst love me before the foundation of the world. So the rapture also exists in an answer to Jesus' prayer. Jesus specifically asked that God makes arrangements for those that God has given Christ, the church, his bride, be allowed to come to live with him. Well, how is Jesus going to get his bride? He's going to get his bride through the rapture. Jesus Christ is going to come get his church for the honeymoon, and then he'll get together with the family later, all the other relatives from the Old Testament all the other relatives that have gotten saved throughout history. But this is this personal time with his personal people, the bride of Christ, you and I, who make up the church of Jesus Christ. There is another reason you need to know about the rapture. And this is where I want you to turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Verse 13, we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. Look at verse 18. 
Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Look at verse 11 of chapter 5. Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another just as you are so doing. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 8, to be absent from the body is to be at home with the Lord. So the thing that you are afraid of, you'll never get to experience. The thing of death that bothers us is the thing that will never, ever affect us. Because you immediately, and I'm going to show you how fast, you immediately go into the presence of the Lord at the moment that the body dies, the spirit leaves, and is immediately, not 10 seconds later, not 20 seconds later, not five months later, there is no such thing as soul sleep. It is not the soul that's the sleep. It's the body that's asleep because you come back with the Lord. You know why? Because you are not your body. You are your soul. Your personhood is your soul, not your body. Your body is the suit in which your soul is located. Okay? So your soul is your being, your personality. It's what makes you different from somebody else. If you find two exact twins who look exactly alike, have the same birthmark, are they the same person? Because they're exact twins? No. What makes the two look like twins different? Two different souls. They have two different souls. And it is the soul that immediately goes into the presence of the Lord. So this return is coming where Jesus Christ is going to come. We, and then he says in verse 15, And this we say to you by the word of the Lord. So as we say this on biblical authority, the reason he says this is because this was never prophesied in the Old Testament. The reason why it wasn't prophesied in the Old Testament was because if the Jews would have accepted Messiah, there would have been no rapture in, in, in the, of the church because there wouldn't need to be a church. But because of their rejection, the church exists. So we say by the word of the Lord that we who are alive, the people who have not died yet, and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not precede those who have fallen asleep. Now, he says he will come back, 1 Thessalonians 4 says, not only with a shout, but with the voice of the archangel. So here we have a second event. Jesus is going to shout, believers, come forth. At that point, if you and I have died, we will begin exiting the tomb. Now, what does Michael the archangel have to do with this? Well, archangel means chief angel in charge. Okay? Number one angel. Who used to be the archangel? Satan. And his name back there was Lucifer used to be chief angel in charge, the anointed cherub. When he blew it, Michael was promoted and given the post of archangel or chief angel in charge. All throughout the Bible, you will see battles between Michael and Satan, angelic conflicts between the chief of the demons and the chief of the angels. All through the Bible, you see this conflict, Daniel 12, 1, Jude verse 9, Revelation 12, 7 and 9. There is this battle between the righteous and unrighteous angels. Jesus is going to say, believers, come forth. But he's going to say it in territory occupied by demons, the realm of death. So Michael, the archangel, who is on the scene with Jesus Christ, will speak the word. What word will he speak? He's the archangel, chief angel in charge. He's going to tell his boys, his homies, you heard what Jesus just said. We know the demons don't want to let them go. Go get them. Now, unless you think I made that up, <laughs> some of y'all looking a little, little, little shaky out there. I don't know about that, Pastor. Turn your Bible to Luke 16. You know, I got to have a vote, vote verse for you folk in the cliff, all right? You remember the rich man and Lazarus? Verse 19 says there was a certain rich man. 
And he was habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, gaily living in splendor every day. And there was a certain poor man named Lazarus was laid at his gate, covered with sores, and longing to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Besides, even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. Now it came about that the poor man died, and he was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. How did Lazarus get escorted from his death place? to Abraham's bosom, paradise, heaven, he got escorted by angels. So when the rapture comes, everybody who has died gets a personal, angelic escort to meet Jesus in the air. All right? So you not only get to live, you get escorted to the place of the reunion. We'll return for more of today's message right after this special announcement from Dr. Evans. Friends, it is our sheer joy to come to you each week with God's truth. You know, we work hard at preparing and preaching and teaching God's Word, and I hope you are not only informed but transformed by the truth that you hear. But to continue doing what we do, we do need your help. We need you to come alongside of us with your prayers and your generous financial support in order to enable us to be able to continue to do what we do in ministering to you. You know, uh, it can cost quite a bit to put all of this together and buy the time in order to have the broadcast come your way. And so if God is using us to bless you, would you be a blessing back to us, whether it's a one-time gift whether you become an inner circle friend of the ministry, which is $25 or more a month, whether you become part of our president's circle, all of those are options, but we do need your help. You can log on to TonyEvans.org and give right over our website, or you can call us at 1-800-800-3222. We do need your regular support, or if you can't do it regularly, one-time support to keep us strong so spiritually we can keep you strong. God bless you. Thank you for standing with us. We can't do what we do without you. We now return to today's message. The dead in Christ shall rise first, the end of verse 17 says, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Now this raises the problem. How in the world are we getting new bodies going to function in the air? Well, it's not a problem when you understand that we will have bodies like his. And remember how Jesus left this earth? He stepped on a cloud. Why? Because the glorified body has properties that your earthly body does not have, even though it's still a body. It will still look like a body. You will look fundamentally as you look now without flaws. Okay? So white people won't become black. Black people won't become white. <laughs> Hispanic people won't become Asian. Okay? So... If you don't like who you are, tough. You are what God created you because he had that race in mind. That's why John could say in Revelation 7, he said, I saw people from every nation, every tribe, every kindred, and every tongue because they kept their visible differences. Guess what? You will not only, we'll talk about this maybe more next week, but you will not only look the same but without flaws, no eyeglasses, no, you know, you will sound the same. I know what you're saying. Pastor, where did you get that from? <laughs> you're just making up stuff as you go along. No, I'm not. Let me tell you the story. You can uh, look it up when you get a chance. When Mary came to the tomb, remember? On early on Sunday morning, the gardener showed up. Okay? She didn't quite recognize him at first. Then he said, even as in our skit Sunday, Mary! Why do you seek the living among the dead? And the text says, when Mary heard his voice, she knew it was the Savior. 
because he sounded the same. So you will be you. I like the way Job says it. I shall see him for myself and not another. You will be, you won't be somebody else. You will be the same you that you are now, simply without the flaws. God, not, God has two bodies for everybody. He's got the natural body you were born with from your mother, and then he's got a spiritual body that will come from him. Now, your mother and father gave you bodies that are good for 70, 80, 90, if you're fortunate, years. They did the best they could. But what do you think your body's going to be like that God makes directly without any human intervention? It's going to be a spectacular body, and he calls it spiritual. Now, now, this is entering into another sermon, but let me just summarize it. What can a spiritual body do? It can pick up on spiritual things that a natural body can't. So, things you can't see now, you'll see then. Right now, all around this room are angels. There are angels all over the place. Right now, as we sit in this room, number one, because the Bible says every Christian has one. Some of us have ours working overtime. <laughs> all right? So every believer has an angel. So, if everybody in this room are, are believers, and we have uh, 600 people in this room, there are at least 600 angels in this room, minimum. Because their job is to cover you. Now, if, if, if God has an angel for every believer, these angels are communicating. They communicate with one another. But we can't pick up on it. You know why? Because we're in our natural bodies. But when you get a spiritual body, since angels are spirits, guess what you get to hear and see? That you can't hear and see with your natural body. You get to hear angelic systems at work. You get to see God in a way you cannot see him in your natural body because God is a spirit. So that's why you will learn more about God than you could possibly learn now because you'll have a body that can take it. God is going to prepare a body, but it will be a body. I like that because the Bible says when Jesus got up from the, gra uh, from the grave, first thing he did was go eat. <laughs> first thing he did. And I know he ate chicken too. I, I know it. And the reason I know it is because he was a preacher. All right. First thing he did, went and met the disciples and ate. Think of that, guys. Eat and not be able to get full. Just think about that. So it's, 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 a, it's a whole nother realm. So you get to enjoy two things, the physical as well as the spiritual, but in a spiritual body, not a natural body. You have a new spirit, but it's not a body. Your spirit is, 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 is intertwined with your soul now. It's not intertwined with your body. Your body is still natural. Okay? So, he goes on then, and he has cited the fact that we, have, we will have a superior body, a body that can walk on water, stand on clouds, walk through doors, all of the above. As part of, that's why he, will say, he says, for example, in 1 Corinthians 6, 3, that we'll be able to judge angels. You can't judge something you can't see and can't communicate with. You can judge it because you can now relate to that realm because you have this new body. Look at Philippians chapter, excuse me, Revelation chapter 3, verse 10. Because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I will also keep you from the hour of testing that hour which is about to come upon the whole earth to test those who dwell upon the earth. That's the tribulation. But notice what he says he's going to keep them out of. He says he's not going to just keep them out of a situation. He says, I'm going to keep you out of the time frame in which the situation occurs or the hour. So to be kept out of the time frame is not simply to be kept out of a situation. It is not to participate in whatever is occurring in that time frame because I'm going to keep you out of that hour. If the hour is the tribulation, and it is, to be kept out of the hour means you don't even go through it, which means that the rapture would, must need be occur before the beginning of the tribulation. The other thing is even from, uh, well, let me go back to, 1 Thessalonians, but 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, God says through the Apostle Paul these words, 1 Thessalonians 1.10, and to wait for his Son from heaven, 
whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who delivers from us from the wrath to come. But the wrath is not only hell, the wrath is the tribulation period, Jacob's trouble. It's a time of the wrath of God. Look at First uh, Thessalonians chapter 5. He says, verse 1, Now as to the times and the epochs, brethren, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord, the day of God's judgment, the tribulation, will come just like a thief in the night. While they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like birth pangs upon a woman with child, and there will be no escape. But you, brethren, are not of the darkness that the day should overtake you like a thief. You won't be caught in this, in other words. When that time comes, you won't get caught because you're not of the darkness. You're of the light. Verse 5, you are sons of the light. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So let us not sleep as, uh, as others do, but let us be alert and sober. Let us keep watching because we're not part of this deal. So since the tribulation is a time of judgment, and since we are protected from judgment, and since we're protected from even the time of judgment, we therefore must of necessity be protected from the tribulation. Let me give a one other verse. 2 Thessalonians 2 raises this again, that none of this can happen until, he says, verse 3, let no one in any way deceive you, because false teachers were telling them that they were going to miss the tribulation, miss the rapture. For it will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed. Remember, we saw the Antichrist must sign the declaration of peace first, who opposes and exalts himself as God of very gods. Then he says in verse 6, And you know what restrains him now, so that in his time he may be revealed. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who, know, he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Who is the restrainer? The restrainer is the Holy Spirit. Where does the Holy Spirit dwell? He dwells in the church. So, when, so if the tribulation doesn't begin till after the Holy Spirit leaves, when the Holy Spirit leaves, who leaves with him? The church, because he indwells the church, the body of Christ. So Paul says, none of this can happen until the Holy Spirit goes. The Holy Spirit can't go without you going, because the only reason we are the church is because we've been baptized by the person of the Spirit. So based on those uh, arguments, we are not to expect to go through the tribulation, but are looking not for the undertaker, but the uppertaker. You know, even in war today, before the U.S. attacks a foreign country, what does it do? It raptures U.S. citizens out. In Kuwait, we told them, come home, right? In, uh, in, in Yugoslavia, we told them, come home. Before we executed our bombing wrath. Same principle. Jesus Christ, God is going to tell his children, come on home. God's getting ready to exercise his wrath, and you don't have your own citizens being bombed on. See? The same concept. So what is the good news here? Well, the good news is that you find comfort. The Holy Spirit gives us comfort now, but our eternal hope gives us comfort later. It calls us the faithfulness in service. 1 Corinthians 15, 58, he says, now that you understand this, uh, be immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Serve him, serve him fully. Should lead to holiness. The Bible says anybody who has this hope in them purifies himself. What if you knew Jesus was coming next year this time? Would you be doing things differently? What if you knew he was coming next month, this day? Would you be in a real hurry to do things differently? What did you know if you, you knew he was coming tomorrow, 5 o'clock? You'd be all night pleading. Right? <laughs> Since you don't know when he's coming, live every day like it could be the day because it just might be. Every, how many here have answering machines? You're not home. Hello, this is the Evans residence. We're not home right now, but please leave a message. And when we return, we will call you back. Right? Something like that. There's only a problem. One problem. The person who called doesn't know when you're coming back. They have heard your message. They have told you they're coming back. It could be five minutes. It could be five hours. If they're out of town, it could be five days or five weeks. You don't know when they're coming back. But the message is clear. We don't know when Jesus is coming back. But the message is clear. The message is clear. And so I challenge all of you, all of us, 
to live in the light of his return. I hope you were challenged by today's message. I hope you get today's message. In fact, I hope you get the whole series, Prophecy, God's Eternal Drama. It will unfold from beginning to end what God is doing in history and where history is going. You can log on to TonyEvans.org or call us at 1-800-800-3222. And you can see all the other resources that we are offering for your spiritual development here at The Urban Alternative. 1-800-800-3222 or log on to TonyEvans.org. May God bless you richly. Thank you for standing with us for your support, which allows us to keep ministering to you. God bless. You can order today's message on DVD or CD or any of our other resources by calling 1-800-800-3222 or by logging onto our website at TonyEvans.org. You can also write us at The Alternative with Dr. Tony Evans, Box 4000, Dallas, Texas 75208. The Alternative with Dr. Tony Evans is a viewer-supported ministry of The Urban Alternative in Dallas, Texas. Tune in next week for more insight on keeping Christian families strong. Biblical insight for the challenges of our lives. Each week on The Alternative with Dr. Tony Evans.